Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, our risen and victorious Lord. Amen. Have you ever served someone? I mean, really served them. Maybe the best example of this kind of service is parents to their children. Kids are expensive. They're a pain in the butt. They take a lot of time and energy, and yet they also are the greatest source of joy for their parents. And parents also willingly serve them, give up their time and energy for them. Or maybe when you hear the word server, you think of a restaurant, and that's an apt image as well. For somebody who is serving you at a restaurant, they are putting your needs and desires and your time before their own. If they're doing a good job, they almost make it seem like they're not really there. Have you ever served someone? Well, maybe it's been a long time since you've truly served someone. Maybe it's been a while since you've served someone in your church, or maybe in your family, or even in your community. Who have you served? Well, let's face it, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the truth is that sometimes we're not good servants. The truth is that we like to place our desires above that of others. Not just people we don't know, but people that God has placed in our life, which we have obligations to. We think our time is too valuable and too important, our energy too priceless to expend on behalf of others. Often, isn't it true that we want the benefits of the relationships and the people in our lives and from God without the work, without the service that he asks us to do. Now, the good news is that despite our failures to serve adequately, we actually can still have hope. And that hope doesn't come from us, but it comes from the fact that we have a Lord, a victorious and risen Lord, who serves perfectly in our stead. In our gospel reading today, this is on full display. The resurrected Jesus is serving his disciples. Now, were they deserving of his service? Well, let's take a look at their track record leading up to the cross. Peter denies Jesus three times after just boasting that nothing would prevent him from standing next to Jesus, even if the whole world was arrayed against them. They all fled in terror after Jesus' arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane and have been in hiding, many of them didn't even witness Jesus' death at the cross. Were they deserving of the service of Jesus, of the service of the Savior of the world? Of course not. But did they earn their favor back before Jesus served them on the shores of the Sea of Tiberias in our Gospel reading? The answer to that again is no. We learned last week that they were locked up in a room afraid that they were going to get wrapped up in all of this Jesus controversy. And who's the one that makes all the effort to bring them to peace? Jesus does, serving them again and again. So I ask you, are you deserving of God's service and provision that he gives you in Jesus? Well, let's check our track record. How are you doing on the Ten Commandments? Not just in action, but in your heart. Have you harbored hatred? Have you shirked the duties that you've been given? Have you decided to place other things in your life before what God is calling you to do? And pretty soon we all realize that our answer to that question is the same for the disciples. No, we're not deserving of God's service. And pretty soon it becomes clear we're being honest with ourselves that we can't earn any favor with him either. For for every step forward, there's multiple steps back. 
all the while journeying on the wrong path. So then why is Jesus, the resurrected Lord, here serving his disciples? Well, let's recall that now that Jesus has been raised, because I think we can raise the stakes here a little bit, now that Jesus has been raised, he is the lamb who was slain that you heard read about in Revelation. He is the only person in all of the heavens and the earth, all of creation and beyond, worthy to open the scroll. This same Jesus, the lamb who was slain and has risen, who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, is serving his undeserving sinful disciples, fish and bread. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that unbelievable? After everything they haven't done for him, he continues to do for them. And if you're tempted to think that your time and your energy is too important to give in the service of others, however important we might think we are, we've got nothing on Jesus. Jesus is the most important being in all of creation. He is the being responsible for its complete redemption and salvation. And yet, here he is, giving of his time and his energy for his undeserving disciples. So why does Jesus do this? In, verse, in the, one of the verses of our gospel reading, it says this. They, the disciples, they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And if you're thinking back to the first time that many of these disciples met Jesus, it's a similar story. Before Jesus comes into the picture in both those stories, all of their work and toil amounts to nothing. And these aren't slouches. These are professional fishermen, and everything they do comes up empty. Then Jesus shows up. And begins to speak, begins to guide, and before they know it, they have so many fish, they can't even get them into the boat. And in the previous story, they got them into the boat, and then the boat started to sink under the weight of all that fish. You see, without Jesus, we accomplish nothing. Our work is fruitless and in vain. So why does Jesus serve? Because he doesn't want that for us. Motivated by this love that we cannot fathom, he comes into the world so that our work is not in vain, so that our toil doesn't end with an empty net, so that our life doesn't end forever. Well, maybe some of you right now are feeling like you've been toiling all night and have come up with nothing. Have you ever felt like that? You put in the hours and the time. It's even maybe something you're good at, and still it feels as if it's fruitless. You feel like you're treading water. For whatever reason, this image always came to my mind when I thought about fruitless things, for a couple of summers, I was a lifeguard at a Boy Scout camp. And the first thing you do when you get there is you do a swim test because we've got to make sure we're not putting people in places where they can't really swim. And there were always, there was always a couple of kids every week that would swim like this, up and then down the exact same way. And all that does is that moves you forward and then backward where you just came from. And you don't get anywhere and they exhaust themselves, and then I have to rescue them. Without Jesus, that's all we can do. We're treading water, we're putting in all this effort and getting nowhere. So if you're feeling like that, think to yourself, where's Jesus? He's on the shore. He's been there the whole time. And he comes to us today, maybe not quite in the same way in our story with the disciples while we're at work. 
But he does come to us. He has promised us his presence. He's promised us his presence in his word. When was the last time you opened up your Bible on your own at home and read from God's word? Or gone to a Bible study here at church? When was the last time you've come to him in prayer? And I can't tell you how many times I've been really stewing on something, frustrated about it, and realize after days and days that I haven't prayed about it. Jesus is the key. And even though in those moments he feels really far away, he's not. He's there, standing on the shore, ready to serve you. And he points you to where your fruits, your labors, are not fruitless. He guides you by his word. But Jesus' service doesn't stop there. He aids you in your service so it isn't fruitless. But then once you, have, you realize who he is, he continues. He draws you to himself. So as soon as they recognize it's the Lord, where are the disciples headed? Straight for him. Once you're in his presence, he again serves you by providing for you what you need to recover from the work and experience the joys of fellowship. In verse 9, it says, When they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. So here we have the lamb who was slain, the most important being in all the universe, and he's made a fire and laid out fish and bread for his undeserving disciples. Jesus, the resurrected Lord, is preparing a meal. I don't know if you know this, but lords, and particularly lords of lords, don't do these things. And yet Jesus is teaching us something about this new creation that he has just begun in his resurrection. That it's all about this service in love. And it's all found its core and its roots in his own action. Dear friends in Christ, Jesus continues in this service all the way up till today. He is the reason you are here. You may have thought you came here for something else, but really that's why you're here. Because Jesus is here. He has drawn you to himself. You recognized him on the shore. There's one last detail of this story that I think really drives this point home. That really helps us understand the depth of the service that God is doing for us. Which it sounds so strange, but it really is what's happening here on Sunday. The great gifts of our service don't come from me. They don't come from you. They come from him. Historically, the church always divided its service into two pieces. The service of the word, because the high point of that service is God's word, which he gives to you as a gift. That's why we respond, thanks be to God. And the second part is the service of the sacrament, where he prepares a meal at his table for us to receive. All from him. Well, this last cool detail of the story that I think drives us home is, he says, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. But notice that even the fish that Simon Peter brings from the disciples weren't really just from them. Because remember, when it was just them, there were no fish. They caught nothing until Jesus came into the picture. And now even the fish, even the gifts that we bring here this morning, they're not really from us. They're from Him. Given by Him, guided by Him so that they are not done in vain. And when we use those gifts, we don't bring glory to ourselves. We bring glory to Him. So, why did you come here today? You may have had lots of immediate reasons that pop into your mind. Maybe you like the people here. Maybe you think the pastor is really handsome. (laughs) Maybe you think the music is fantastic and you like singing. 
Or maybe you heard there's food after the service, and that's what you really came for. But really, there's only one correct answer. And maybe that's how he got you here, but the reason he wants you here is not for any of those things. It's because he is here. And he's not just here for you to look at, but he's here to serve you. He has guided you in faith so that your work is not fruitless or in vain. He has beckoned you to come to him. And when you arrive, he has served you a meal to restore you from that labor, to sustain you in that faith and in his name. All those years ago on the shore of Tiberias, he says to his disciples, come and have breakfast. What a mundane statement, but not mundane when it's given by the king of the universe. Dear friends in Christ, he still offers you that same invitation today. He says, come to my table. It's set. Just like when the disciples got on the shore, all the things were prepared already. It has been laid out for you. Come and have something to eat. Have you served someone recently? Well, if not, you should. Not because in your serving you earn acceptance or favor from God. Just like the disciples, if we're going up that, if we're barking up that tree, we're going to get empty nets over and over again. No. You ought to serve because you have been served mightily by the most important person of all, Jesus, our resurrected Savior. In his name, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and in his service to you until he comes again to make all things new.